First of all, the people who want to do liberation need to think before they act. They need to study and develop a strategy, a plan. It might work. To do that, since the situations are very different for different people in different countries, um, we have a guide which is a, a, another study called Self-Liberation, a guide for strategic planning for action to end the dictatorship or other oppression. That to plan a strategy, see people used to come to us and say, tell us what to do. We don't do that. So we tell them no because we don't know your situation and the peculiar characteristics of your place in the problem. So we used to send people away to read and study without precise instructions. I concluded after a long time that in working with Jamila Rakib, that there are three things that people need to know to become able to plan their own strategy. Because relying on someone else for your strategy is no good. You need to know your opponent in depth, including the weaknesses of your opponent. You need to know and understand nonviolent struggle in depth, really. And the people who insist they already know, they don't know. So to save them much reading, we reduce the amount of pages they need to study down to only 900 pages in English, mostly by myself and by Robert Helvey. Then the, there's still a factor missing. They need to know how to think strategically as a good army officer would know how to think strategically. Maybe they don't all, but some of them do. Mm. And if you have those three special types of knowledge, then you have a chance of planning your own strategy. Not every nonviolent struggle succeeds. If the people who are planning the struggle don't know what they're doing, if the people do not have a firm base, in social institutions, if the people are frightened and weak, if they beca become terrorized by the regime, it's likely to fail. But in that case, they need to not plan a campaign for this one big struggle, but plan smaller struggles that are an issue that the opponent can be defeated on or can give way on and bit by bit then you chip off this part of regime's control and the oppressed people become stronger and more able to plan and you have a greater chance. But just as all wars are not successful, and only at least one side loses in a war, which is not a very good success rate, you know. Similarly, in nonviolent struggle, you have to be able to carry it out skillfully, have a wise strategy, not something to express anger, but to actually achieve smaller victories and finally a big victory. If the people are not able to plan the nonviolent strategy, they're not able to plan a violent strategy either. Then the problem is, see, the violent strategy, that's foolish. Your opponent always, maybe with one or two minor exceptions somewhere, but almost always has vastly more military capacity than the oppressed people. That's the nature of a dictatorship. So if you choose to fight with your enemy's best weapons, you're going to lose. Even though a non sword is going to be difficult, it becomes virtually impossible to achieve by violence. So you better reassess your situation 
And remember, people often cite the terrible things that oppressors do and what they have done in the past and what they're capable of doing now, what they threaten to do. But that's not a plan for success. That's the plan to express your anger, your frustrations, your fear. That's not a way to achieve victory. That is strange to some people. They think, well, we're the people of oppressed. Why should we have to use nonviolent means? Because they do such terrible things to our people. But the question is not what they ought to do ethically and morally, but what can be done. And since the, oppress, the oppressor people are so powerful, they are not going to be struggling strongly to liberate the oppressed population, the oppressed nation. So that oppressed nation is the only one that has a chance to really change the behavior to contribute to changes. Just as there are some Israelis who support the Palestinians, even though the overwhelming Israeli force is against the Palestinians. But some of them are sympathetic, some of them participate. You, but you have to take that into consideration in planning your strategy. Especially if it follows a previous conflict in which the oppressed people have waged violence also. That does not help a future struggle for nonviolent means by the oppressed nation. So there's going to be a very difficult situation there. You have to overcome all of the bitterness, all of the tragedies in which the oppressed nation people were involved. Hmm. It's, it's not like starting out from no no history is starting out from a bad history. So that's going to be very tough. And then for the first people need to concentrate on small steps, build up some control over their own lives, simple things, of raising their own food, for example, so that having their own sources of energy, if possible, of uh, it is maintaining, if they have a different language, maintaining that language with the young children. If there are religious principles that the children need to learn, you often can do that, even under extreme repression. But it will be difficult. They have to build up some capacity for strength, or the regime is trying to take away all capacity for strength from the oppressed people. It's a place where the oppressed people have a little bit of possible control. Even if they're able to push back the controls a bit from the oppressor, each gain is important, even though it's very small. And where, you've, where it has been a situation of extreme violence on both sides, and it's the oppressor nation is visibly powerful in many ways, just a few of which we mentioned. That is going to be very difficult and take a long time. But there's no other way to do it, so I can see. Maybe people of that situation will find another way. That's up to them. But they must be very careful not to play into the hands of the oppressors who want to take all those controls away from them. They must be very careful that they will gain the limited control and more and more, and not not submit to having their children all learn the foreign language, but have be able to maintain their own language if they can, if they can, and where that has been reduced, the degree of their use of their own language, then the parents and the people in a small community that trust each other must constantly persist in maintaining the language of the of the oppressed people. As one, and similarly for religion. Religious groups have been oppressed for many, thousands of years. That's nothing new. But despite that, those, like, those religious principles that were once almost eradicated, they sometimes come back and give people something, a sense of their own power and their own ability to control something. It will take a long time, 
if it follows the history of great violence on both sides. It depends on the actual situation. That's why we don't have a blueprint to be applied everywhere for all different kinds of conflicts. That's part of the first part of these th three areas of knowledge that are needed, including the knowledge of the oppress oppressor nation in depth. And then what are the resources, what are the strengths of the people in the diaspora? What are they good at? Maybe they've got some bad ideas that really are stupid, you know, in which case the oppressor, the oppressed people need to perceive where the, uh, the diaspora people are not wise because they are now out of the real situation. But maybe they can help in various ways in making possible, uh, in some cases, radio transmissions. There are some kinds of radios they can be smuggled in because they're into the occupied area because the radios are so small. Or maybe they operate without certain kinds of electricity, but use other kinds of electricity. It all is related to understanding the real situation in which that conflict continues. Well, that's part of the adjustment to meet that particular situation. You may need a major effort at education in those countries and worldwide education on what, they go, what has occurred and what your aims are. If you aim a, a huge objective that seems not justified, you're that, not likely to get a lot of support for that. If you have a limited objective that would enable you then, after winning that, to move on to a higher objective that enables people to support you, or enables people in the, the uh, other countries, other governments, to no longer continue as if they supported the terrible things, including attempts at massive killings. Uh, to, we need to change the opinions in those of the people in that country, and that is sometimes influenced by the people of the, of the who are the victims. Amnesty International simply one of the groups that does draws attention to oppression in other countries, regardless of who is supporting it. After the oppressed people have regained a great deal of control of their society and got greater international sympathy, you do not get war crimes trials, international war crimes trials in The Hague, or the people in are oppressed and are able to do nothing. Mm -hmm. That only comes after you have regained a certain amount of capacity and sympathy and support in other, among other governments and other parts of the world. No, I do not. Hmm. But that again is that something way down the line. Hmm. You're starting in a terrible situation and the oppressed people fe feel they are helpless. So the idea of what they're going to do for a war crimes crime where the leaders are perpetrators of the oppression and slaughters, you can't solve that this year. You got other tasks you have to do first. Oh, maybe for several years, because this, there is no miracle answer for that kind of a situation. It is going to be tough to achieve anything, or just to lift the extremity of the existing oppression. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very hard. So, almost, it's almost a bad idea to waste your time on something that might or might not happen in five or ten years. Focus on what can be done this year and the next two or three years and how the people who are oppressed can regain some control. And there are various factors in that, including greater self-respect for themselves, mm -hmm. awareness of what they have done that's been good, some facet of their characteristics that inspire sympathy, how to overcome the things their own people, the oppressed people, that parts of them have done in the past that have been despicable, because that certainly does not help the present situation. Do you have to get a real sense of their own self-respect and potential in order to wage a non-violent struggle compositely? Uh, he said many things, depending on the circumstances sometimes. But uh, 
If he did not see how Navasara would work in the extreme situation adequately, he did not see adequately. All right, the problem is still there. Even if Gandhi didn't have an answer, if he didn't. So one must tackle the problem. How can people who are oppressed and the control and sympathy for the oppressed people is not there? If they, in fact, believe in the justification for bloody repression of these people, then now you have to tackle it and look at the other historical cases. Not the British in India, and the British were also more cruel than they're given credit for in India. There was the massacre of Jalimwala Ba, for example, in Amritsar. It's simply one machine gunning of 370 or so men, women, and children by the British, General Dyer. So forget the naivete about the British Indian conflict, but focus on the nature of extreme struggles. How is it that people in, in Poland, for example, could act? How is it that Germans could help not only kill Jews, but help save Jews? How is it that women in Berlin who are not Jewish were married to Jewish men? How is it they could demonstrate on the streets of Berlin two blocks from Gestapo headquarters and get their men brought back from the camps where they were going to be exterminated? Those are not cases where you had great sympathy. The Jews were regarded as untermenschen, subhumans, and still some limited struggles were there. How Jews in Norway and Denmark were for the most part saved. I've even heard the Jews in Bulgaria were largely saved. Totally in contrast to the Nazi ideology of subhumans that deserve only for extermination. Look at those cases for answering the question you described, that the objective of the Nazis was fairly universal, but the, the Nazis did not succeed in getting the number of Jews out of each country that they wanted. Hmm. In some cases they got a large number of them. In some cases they got very few, as in Denmark, for example, as in Norway. and. And in some cases, even in Germany itself, this roundup of the last, last roundup of the Jews, whereas Jewish intellectuals and artists were to be rounded up, and uh, the people working in the factories even would be taken out of the factory and rounded up for extermination. That's the situation in which these about 6,000 German women demonstrated and got the men brought back, hmm. not just released, but brought back freed, even though some of them were already in the camps. And thereby they, those women defeated the major Nazi objective regarding Jews to make Germany Jew-free, hmm. in their hideous phrase. They did it when it was not supposed to be possible. That's simply one of the cases which needs to be studied. And Gandhi didn't maybe say much of help on that score. You know, just the word justified hmm. has to be carefully evaluated. What does that really mean? Does it mean, is it morally more right? Even if it means that, even if you conclude it morally, it was okay, you didn't violate some moral principle that you believe in. But what are the results? You can have some action you conclude is morally right, but it can be an absolute political failure. And you can take some action which you should supposedly not be able to take and defy this regime and win, even though some people might think you better you should have been killing people instead. But you have to say, Malaysia is not by what you think you, it, the atrocities permitted by regimes have permitted others to do. If, they just, if each side does the thing that's mostly it's most hideous behavior, you're only going to get mass slaughters and more people killed. Only, only that. And you need to focus on how can, not how can we be justified in carrying out violence, but how can we change the situation? 
and that actually, for changing the situation, you can evaluate them. That in, it was that type of action was morally justified, even though people said might say, "Well, you should you abuse violence." Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you do nothing. It's not just the absence of violence. It's that you're doing something to actually change the situation, or developing a grand strategy for how to defeat the objectives in those extreme situations, and based upon the analysis of whatever is available from historical experiences. See, there may, can be many campaigns in a war, and a major conflict. You can have many campaigns, some for very limited purposes, a limited objective, which is maybe all that you possibly can gain at that time with the knowledge and strength and judgment of the oppressed people. And they may have retained the belief or the dream or the conviction of full independence. If they're not capable of getting it, they could sell work for achieving what they can achieve at this stage and then go on to other objectives as they become stronger. And as the oppressed, pressure people begin to understand that maybe they did not understand fully the situation these people were suffering under. But you won't get big international interventions at the time the oppressed people are weak. It won't come. That international attention will only come when they have become stronger 